Welcome everybody to the Solutions Podcast and this month we are with Morag Gamble. So welcome Morag from the great land of Australia which I miss so much, you know, my youth. It's where I spent 15 years living and, and Morag is living the permaculture dream in this absolutely beautiful place. So welcome Morag. Thank you, Nicola. It's lovely to chat with you. It's lovely to have seen you recently at the permaculture event in the UK. Yeah, yeah. It's it's this connected. bringing together of, you know, people that are actually doing shit. Yes. Like, <laughs> you know, we, I think there's still, though, there's so much confusion about what permaculture is. I think a lot of people, you say the word permaculture, and it's just like, isn't that some kind of like hippie organic growing? And and that's where it ends. You know, people just think it's just growing food. And and there's so much more to, you know, what, what permaculture is. So, so what's your take on, what's your elevator pitch on what is permaculture? <laughs> well, that's such an interesting question because it all... It always depends on who's in the elevator with me, so to speak. <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm, um, but, but a generalized one would be really it's about designing for one planet living. That's the simplest that I can, that I can make it. But how, how can we design to bring in that ethical framework, that really deep care for the planet, and deep care for all life? on this planet, including humanity. Uh, so that's that earth care, people care, fair share. I think those three ethics just so beautifully sum up what it is and 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 sort of ta- dangling from those ethics are, are a core set of design principles that are inspired by nature and inspired by traditional practices that help to provide a bit of a, a questioning uh, practice to, to look at the problems that we're facing and sort of say, well, how can we design this in a way that brings greater integration? How can we design this that's really attending to scale? How can we design something that's really looking at, you know, bringing to make it really purposeful and it has some kind of yield, but at the same time, it's deeply caring for the place that it's from. So it's really an ethical framework within which to make decisions about anything that you're doing. You can design your businesses with with permaculture. You can design your home with with permaculture you can design uh you know the clothes that you wear and the the food cycles but it's another way that i describe it too it's applied systems thinking you know it's really about that interconnectedness and looking at how you can tend to the relationships between things rather than just the parts because permaculture is not like going, okay well i've got a vegetable garden over there and i've got a, a compost heap over there and some chickens up there having the bits is not the permaculture. It's how you design this, the the interconnectedness between those and between uh, you and those systems and also about tending to how that whole system in itself, the, that human system you're designing is interacting and supporting the greater um, flourishing of all life in that place. And so, you know, another way, another little small elevator pitch kind of thing that I might say sometimes is, the imperative of permaculture is to diminish the hu- human footprint on this planet and to work deeply towards regenerating uh, the earth systems. And, you know, if, if I'm just talking to kids, they'll say, oh, it's just really about love, you know, loving the planet and loving life. <laughs> so it all depends, you know, and that's kind of a permaculture thing to say, well, it all depends because it does always depend. It's always about the context. It's not about a set of, recipes that you just cookie cut a plonk all over the place it's very much about connecting in with place with community like who's in the room who needs to be in the room who you know really looking at all all of life but not just life itself but the the rocks and the rivers and the winds and like all of it together so it's a whole systems approach and Maybe one more little lens, one more little elevator pitch would be around. Well, it's a lens. It's a. It's like putting on a permaculture lens through which you view yourself and in, in relation to the world. And and I really like that. Like let's, let, you know, I often take class and say, okay, we're putting on our permaculture lens now. <laughs> let's go and have a look at what we can find. 
I love it. There are this, it's like this multifaceted crystal, I suppose, isn't it? You know, it ha- the different angles that you look at it, although the core is the same. And, you know, and really the core is this deep indigenous wisdom that, you know, when we're talking to some people, I mean, I, I was lucky. I did my permaculture design course about 15 years ago with dear Patrick Whitefield. And uh, so it was a blessing being with him. And I, I did the course and I said, but Patrick, this is just common sense. And his answer to me was, yes, but common sense is not common. And it was just brilliant. I was like, yeah, common sense is not common. We have to teach this stuff. And what to us and to some of us may seem like, well, this is kind of obvious or to the indigenous people, it'd be like, "Mm, well, yeah, this is kind of like what we've been teaching for a long time. But for those of us that have, you know, moved away from living with nature and lost that understanding of cycles and rhythms and systems and how it all works together, it is, it's this whole big new way of looking at the world. And, you know, I mean, it actually, you know, the term permaculture, you know, the founders of permaculture, you know, it started over in Australia. So, you know, that, you know, this, this was where the seed of this work came from. And, you know, now, you know, it seems to have spread to all corners. I mean, you know, what country doesn't have anybody practicing permaculture? <laughs> I don't know. You, you, can, you don't have to scratch very far on the surface of, of the soil of a community and you will find someone who's doing it or someone who relates to it, someone who has heard the term and understands a bit about it. It has, it, And I talk about it in a way that it's myceliated. You know, when there's a good idea, it kind of just gets stolen. Not stolen, but, you know, it, get, it just gets taken and it goes and it goes and goes. And that's what permaculture has done because it does really often give voice to something that has been lost it gives a way in which we can re reimagine and you know with the cultures that have been disconnected for a long time but also give voice and revalue to the ones that are being pressured to submit and so i think it gives that that really important uh conversational space for those sorts of explorations to happen so yeah i so it myceliates and this myceliation, I think, is really important because it's not like it's this institutional structure where there's this hierarchy and there's a boss of permaculture. There is no boss of permaculture. There is really no one that gives you authority to do it. There is a there is an agreed kind of process that, you know, you teach permaculture and then you take that on, you teach someone else permaculture and you teach. And so you just keep localising and adapting it and, and making it your own in your own place. And, you know, I teach permaculture teachers now, and this is one of the things that I really focus on, that, yes, there is a core, you know, set of curriculum that's agreed that 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 is what is essentially what permaculture is about. But what does it look like in your place with the people that are sitting in the room with you, with the resources that you have around you, and uh, really adapt and localise it wherever you are and bring it into your local language and teach it through, you know, you know the, the systems with it that you would like to design, say, a food forest, because, you know, you go into the forest that are around you and so your food forest replicates how nature works in, in that place. So it is that very much a, a, a way of doing biomimicry. And uh, so this myceliation, and I think the important part of that is it's pretty much underground. And it is sort of quite revolutionary. It's quite radical. It's a very radical educational model and a very radical way of doing a lot of different things. But it's so, I don't know, intangible sometimes that it's, you you know, sometimes because people do think it's gardening, it can go a lot further, a lot faster across the planet into communities that you would not expect it to get there. So I think because it has that possibility, uh, it, it has enormous power in it. And, and I often think about this flipping where the power is. You know, we get stuck in this idea that we have to focus on, you know, I'm I'm sort of holding my hands, sort of showing a pyramid. You've know, you, you got to knock off the top person. But what happens in that sort of pyramid hierarchical thing is new ones just walk up to the top and, you know, take that place. Whereas when you flip what the power narrative is and the power to change 
into this myceliating network of this rich tapestry of of communities that are all feeding each other, often unseen. And every now and then there'll be this this sort of like the fruiting body, the mushroom that pops up above the surface and and it becomes this shining light in a way. People go, oh, there's the permaculture and and you start to see it. And, and uh, you know, so you just keep tending and adding compost to different parts of it and they'll keep popping up. And, you know, if you think about how, how mushrooms are, like the mushrooms when they spore, you might get 16 billion spores from one mushroom and then they just kind of out and land somewhere. And if you've tended to the soil, you tend to the context, they will land well. So I think one of the key things with permaculture is, is really just being out in the world and being seen and being, being visible as much as you can to talk about the possibilities, like the, being a possibilitarian. I think you call it being a solutionist. And I, it's the same kind of thing, like really shining a light on the things that are working well. We know what's going wrong. We need to acknowledge that, but we also need to really focus on on being and another word that um that the perma youth, my daughter was part of starting up the perma youth. They call themselves practivists. So, uh, you know, this positive practical activists, people who are doing everyday practical activism through permaculture. And I think it's it's you know, then shaping a lot of the young people involved, you know, whatever it is that they go into that if they bring that ethic, bring that lens with them, that they will start to shape the kinds of decisions that are being made. And I really think, you know, it is a paradigm. It is a way of seeing that does kind of like bump us off the rails that we're on in Western society and to really open up our, open up our ability to perceive other ways of knowing and our ability to perceive nature's inherent wisdom and to acknowledge that, we're not apart from nature. We are nature. It's not like, you know, there's food growing over there and city here with all the people and then nature out there. It's like how we all are one and the same in the one place and how we can create places that nourish humanity, nourish other species, nourish the soil, plant water, you know, really focusing on tending to the biodiversity and the restore and the repair of our own nature, repair of our own sense of who we are in in that space so that we can then make better decisions live in a way that is going to help to restore educate raise children raise families shape community organizations in a way that has this really beautiful heart i was just having a conversation this morning with jeremy lant and, and daniel christian val and and you know one of the things that it, we came down to at the end of it was like it's really a lot about just love and kindness, isn't it? Like, but with a fierceness. Like I think we need to be fierce in our love and our kindness at the moment because there is, well, there's so much that's going on. But we can't be angry. We can't add to the conflict that's happening. Like the, there's this necessity to hold like another way forward, another way that we can ground all of that knowing of what's going on and to live into a, a different way forward and to show what that could look like because I think more than anything now too there is the need to see what a different possibility could look like what does it taste what does it feel like what I mean that's why I'm here like I've kind of experimented with my life like I've been living in this eco village for 25 years in the purpose of me being here in this eco village, I intentionally came here to try to experiment with what does it mean to live in the commons? What does it mean to live inside a Western society and live differently? So, you know, we have our compost toilets and our, you know, energy, you know, we're off grid, we have the food, we have community, we have the commons, we still have our own little places, but it's very much replicating a more traditional way of being. But something that when when people come here, they go, oh, I, I recognise it, but hang on a tick. It's quite different, isn't it, really, when we look at it? I used to only just recently stopped doing it for about 25 years. I hosted um, high school students here on camps. They would come out here and they would, I would just immerse them in, you know, doing deep time walks along the river and looking at, you know, local economic systems and exploring what it meant to design your house in a way that was passive solar and, you know, just getting them to taste all these different foods and, you know, smear, smear aloe vera through their hair as a conditioner, you know, like just do all these 
silly little things. But anyway, um, at the end of it, we'd always have this circle and, and discuss things. And at the end, there was this one girl, and I'll never forget it. She said, Miss, they always call us Miss. I don't know why. It's a thing here in, in Australia. I don't know. Maybe it is where you are too. But Miss, it's like there's this whole other civilization just across the hills from us. We never knew that it was here before. And I thought it was so, they obviously recognized it was something quite different. But yeah, they said, but we really love it. And it doesn't seem that hard to do this. And I just thought, yeah, okay. That's, that's the kind of thing that if people can recognize and are not shut off, go no not doing that I can't do that that's too different I'm going to face away from it like that they can face to it see it go yeah I could do that oh that's not that hard oh that feels like that could actually be something that is far more appealing and attractive as a way forward and and actually I was just doing a community talk um, down in the region recently and this woman came up to me and she said are you from Crystal Waters? I said, yes. And she said, well, you didn't happen to run courses at your place, did you? She said, you know, about 20 years ago, I went up there as a high school student and I did that and it changed my life. And she went, her whole direction, she said, shifted from going towards something like engineering to doing environmental studies and she said that experience. And so I think what I'm saying is that I think it's important that we have these experiences that we create these places where those transformative experiences can can happen where we can find ourselves and I noticed too that particularly during you know the pandemic and the lockdowns there was a lot more talk about this yearning it, like that those words like a yearning to reconnect a yearning to grow something a yearning to feel like you were doing something purposeful that could feed towards a more resilient future and make you feel safe like there's a safety in it like it is actually real security with this so we've been fooled into thinking that having greater levels of income and stuff that we're more secure whereas in actual fact having clean air clean water great community surrounded by a landscape that you know where where the foods are and not just a mr mcgregor's vegetable garden but actually a food forest that is really robust and resilient and you can be harvesting from at all times. You know, it's one of my favorite things to do is to 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 go into these workshops and just fill the tables with all these parts of plants that people would never have thought of eating before and just start munching on them, <laughs> talking about, you know, because we 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 talk about food waste as being, you know, maybe 40% of the food that's grown gets wasted. I would hazard to say that it's more like 90%, 80, 90%, because we just throw away all these edible parts of things that have been grown, we just don't recognise it. So you can possibly 10 times the amount of food or 100 times the amount of food that you can grow simply by shifting your perception because, you know, we and only what eat. You can. Yeah. <laughs> what you can. There's only three crops that feed 60% of the world's calorie, you know, corn, rice and, and wheat, and then 12 crops that are the rest. And it's all because it was industrial. And one of the biggest lies that we fed is that, well, we have to do big ag because how we feed the world's population, whereas in actual fact, 75% of the world's calories are grown by small-scale farmers who have under two hectares and they're mostly women. So it's a massive great lie that we're being fed to support the ongoing subsidies that go into big ag, whereas in actual fact, if we could get that kind of news out there, I think... <laughs> But most food is actually grown by small farmers, isn't it? I mean, yes. we, we look at it and, and we think that, oh, most farm is grown by this like massive farm. It's like, no, actually, it's like lots and lots of small farmers, you know, in other countries, which and that's that's the way that they work. But, you know, you touched on quite, uh, you know, a few things. I mean, we, we sing from the same song sheet, obviously. But, um, you know, these this this terminology that we're using about, you know, replication, when something works, nature replicates it. And, and that's one thing that permaculture does. It's like, okay, this system works. Let's replicate this. Let's do this in a different country. Let's move on away from the idea of sustainability into the idea of regenerating. And I remember um, I was the, the warm up act for Vandana Shiva one time. And um, we were chatting behind uh, the stage. And I said something about something being sustainable. And she said to me, oh, dear, don't use that word. And I was like, what? 
you know, everybody uses the word sustainable. Sustainable is like the goal, where we're going. And um, so she then said to me, imagine that there is a husband and a wife. And you said to the husband, how is your marriage? And he said, sustainable. <laughs> is that really what the wife wants to hear? Yeah, our marriage is sustainable. It's okay. Is that actually the relationship we want with the earth? And, you know, and it was like this light bulb moment. And she said, and does an apple tree give a sustainable amount of apples? Nature doesn't do sustainable. It's this human concept the, that we've come up with and we need to challenge. And it's that constant challenging of the way that we look and the things that we just take for granted and carry on with. And, you know, I mean, I've got a, a classic little permaculture story where there's a the wonderful permaculture magazine, dear Tim, who we've just is walking on the other side now. And the amazing work that Tim and Maddie have done for so many years of bringing permaculture magazine to the world. And one day somebody wrote in to, to permaculture magazine from Guatemala and they said, we we don't have much food, our children are malnourished, we don't have any clean water and there's rubbish everywhere. Is there, you know, is anyone can help us? And all I get was a message from Maddie and it just said, a job for Peel. And, <laughs> uh, and she forwarded me the message. <laughs> so, so well, okay, I could go to Guatemala on my way to Ecuador. And so that's what I did. I thought six weeks, I'll go to this village. And, and I turn up and it's like, right, where do we start? You know, yes, all these things, the, the children were malnourished, there was no food, there was loads of rubbish. And, and I looked around and I noticed that there was a steep bank down to this perfect growing area. And I said, well, look down there, that looks like an amazing place that you could be growing food. Yeah, but we can't get there. Okay, job one, let's put in a path. So straight away, we created a path down and opened up to this, this lovely growing area. Well, okay, we need to make compost. So it was a Rastafarian community in, well, it's Belize actually. Was it Belize? It was right on the border of Belize and Guatemala, a place called Livingstone. And, um, and so I was like, okay, we've got to teach compost. So how do we teach composting? So I thought, I know what, I'm going to put on a sports day because they all love playing football and they love playing sports. So... Um, came up with this idea of um, having a barrel which was gonna put the food compost and a plastic bottle where they were gonna put all the plastic waste. And so they could see that in the compost, anything that was paper, anything that was gonna break down. And they then would run like a relay. They'd pick up a banana skin or a plastic bottle. They'd run all the way back and they'd have to put it in the right container. And this, you know, these exercises that we're teaching, the two things that I wanted to teach, one was, okay, we've got to make compost. And the other was, we need to clean up the rubbish and we're going to build using these eco bricks, these plastic bottles. So that was the first step. So, okay, let's get the education out there. And uh, how can we get this in everyone's houses? So I find this big waste pile of um, big paint containers, empty paint containers. So got all the kids together. It's like, right, we're going to paint them all up with raster colors. And they worked out as a really nice seat in the kitchen that opened up and turned into a compost bin. So it's like, okay, now we've all got compost bins in our garden, in our houses. They double up as a seat. And, um, and then we're going to build a compost system where everybody takes their compost down to this new growing area, makes the compost system and grows the food. Like, great. Okay. Now we're going to put on, you know, this, uh, this uh, another fun day. And the entrance is plastic bottles filled with rubbish. And um, you get an empty plastic bottle with a stick. You jam in all the crisp packets and the sweet packets and the plastic bags and the jam it in hard, put the lid on, make a brick. It's like, okay. So I then built a bench. I showed them out of the village's rubbish, we built a bench. Spoke to the mayor and said, well, look, we really, really need to get some rubbish bins. And hey, as this is a raster community, let's just make them really cool and paint them up with raster colors so people want to use the bins. So all of this kind of like happened within a few weeks. And okay, water system. This is how we build a, a water system and we can use sand 
and charcoal to create a water filter. And there we are. And off I went. And about a year later, I got this amazing little slideshow sent to me of there was eight benches got built. They were they were standing there holding all this food. And you know, just to show that it just takes, you know, some of us that have the knowledge to go and plant the seed and say, hey, you can do this, 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 and this. And then it's over to you. Yeah. And that's and what seeing, happened. The poss- seeing the possibilities instead of seeing, instead of seeing the problem of the rubbish, seeing the opportunities of that becoming a brick, instead of seeing the, you know, and that is that is, I think, just the beauty of a permaculture mind, isn't it? Turning that rubbish into a resource. Yeah. And it does take time, though, for it to get into your elbows and your knees. And you need to take yourself out and see different examples and be willing to play and and have a go and keep trying. And and then just, yeah, when you're in a community, bring people along to be creative with you. And, and, uh, yeah, I I love that example. That is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, it is, it's about sharing, isn't it? It's all about, you see a good idea over here and it's like, oh, cool. I remember I was in Tasmania. I was actually in the world's tallest tree sit in Tasmania for Greenpeace and the Wilderness Society. And the one little thing I remember going away, going, that's a really cool idea. You know, Greenpeace were trying to stop, you know, any kind of, you know, sickness bugs going around the camp, the base camp that was there. And um, there was very limited water. So we had to, everybody needs to wash their hands, but we don't have running water. How do, what do we do? You get a tin can and you pierce a few holes in the bottom of the tin can. You attach it with a piece of string and you dip the tin can into the water, hang it up on a peg and then wash your hands under the running water coming out of the little tiny holes. And it meant that there wasn't any touching things that meant that people washed their hands and then walked away. You know, it was such a simple, genius way of ensuring that you use a little bit of water. Everybody washed their hands. They weren't all touching the same stuff. And and so it's these really, really simple, practical solutions that, you know, we can then, you know, spread to others. And I think the simpler, the better, actually, and as shareable as possible, that as, as low tech low low to anyone can do it with whatever resources you can find around you because I think we're kind of stuck in this dynamic of wanting to have really complicated solutions or very expensive solutions and and almost overlooking these simpler solutions as oh that couldn't possibly be the answer whereas in actual fact if we can sort of pull back and just pay attention to that those simple basic solutions can in the most parts of the world just actually be the solutions that we're looking for absolutely i mean you've got to laugh haven't you this this idea that tech is going to save the world we're going to build these carbon capture and storage plants and they're going to suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere they don't work they've never worked it's a total you know this 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 dream this pipe dream that you know big industry keep feeding us And it's like, well, we know other things which can also capture carbon. They're called trees and soil. And (laughs) soils and oceans. You know, I think and tending to those are just just keeping on, keeping on sharing that message and just keeping it going, I think is what we can do. You know, it it can be quite frustrating watching what's going on and, and get caught up. You know, a lot of my life I've been an activist too, but the the most effective I can be is as a practivist, I think, this possibilitarian, this positive practical activism of like, okay, here's what's possible here. We have agency here. We can do this. This is this is what we can all do. And what can you do in your place and your place and your place? And before you know it, poof, it's everywhere. And, uh, and the it, which is- comes to my, my favourite all-time saying by Joan Byers, which is action is the antidote to despair. So many people are in deep despair. And it's yes. like, hey, you just need to get active. You need to be doing something. And then you don't have time to be in despair. It's such a motivator to really help people. But before we end this talk, Morag, I would love you to just tell us quickly about this amazing foundation that you have, where not only are you teaching permaculture to people there in Australia, but there's a part of the giving back ethos where, you know, you're helping you know, around the world. So if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, of course. So thank you for asking. 
So it's actually called the Ethos Foundation. So it does have a beautiful ethos at its core. The Ethos Foundation is one of the sister, or so I have an ecology of organizations. So there's the Permaculture Education Institute, which is where I focus on teaching uh, permaculture teachers mostly. And I was wanting to open that up and offer it to anyone who wanted to join, for example, from the Global South, from refugee communities, from Indigenous communities, from, from youth. And then I got to the point of realising, well, actually, most of them don't have access to digital technology, obviously, for many reasons. So how how can I continue to support that, that myceliation of permaculture education? So the Ethos Foundation, uh, we support young leaders who have the capacity to come in and learn and then enable them with the funds from the global permaculture community to then take it out and locally adapt it, putting their local language, attend to it in a way that makes sense to them. So it's landed amazingly in refugee communities across East Africa in particular. And uh, so there's this wide network. So every time I run things like a, a free um, permaculture film club. So I just ran one the other day uh, with Vandana Shiva's film, um, run permaculture masterclasses with permaculture people from around the world. And they're always free and available to anyone so that we don't have to have pay what you can, you're low income, you're high income. You don't have to, it's just free for anyone who wants to come. But if you can, please donate and we'll put that 100% across to these projects. So really trying to bring equity and access into it, but also a sense of, of tithing and paying it forward. And so that's what Ethos Foundation does. And so there's a there's a number of partner organizations from grandmothers groups to um, women, young women working with um, eco-literacy and biomimicry with children, working with trauma through that, and others who are working with young men to create sort of right livelihoods. And gosh, it, it just keeps rippling out. Also music, the culture of permaculture. So using art, uh, music, poetry, dance as well to express permaculture. Some young guys said, oh, you know, I really like this permaculture thing and I can see its benefit, but I reckon more we're going to get it much further if we sing it. And so they started writing songs about permaculture and then sing it and then they made music videos and you see all these young kids following them through the camp. And and uh, so they ended up getting some funding from the Grateful Dead to, to build a a, a mud brick solar powered uh, compost toileted music studio that doubles as a permaculture education center awesome. brilliant brilliant so there's lots of things that are just happening consistently through that and um, we're open any day for anyone to support us and we always give 100 percent across um, to locally adapted permaculture education for those people who absolutely need it the most and who are doing regenerative work permaculture work and community healing work all simultaneously it's fantastic i will definitely also link in with some of the indigenous communities that i work with in the ecuadorian amazon who you know there is an amazing woman lexi groper down there at amisachu that's been teaching uh you know permaculture and we've been teaching agroforestry we've got 12 indigenous communities where we're teaching agroforestry and so the more that we can all start to kind of like link up and so i will definitely pass on your links and i will put at the end of this show the details of Morag and the, your institute and the foundation. So thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, hopefully the people that listen, you know, find out a little bit more and, and going back to the music, great plug as well for Charlie. If anyone wants to know about permaculture, the formidable vegetable sound system, you can just listen to that and that'll give you a taste about what permaculture is all about in music. So there's many people doing great things and there's many ways that we can learn about it, whether that's through the magazine, through the Institute, through song. So yeah. We've all just got to become practivists. <laughs> Thanks so much, Morag. Thanks, Nicola. It's been an absolute delight chatting with you today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.